big G is the fundamental one, Newton's universal gravitational constant. Uh, and that's the one that really tells you, in general terms, how much gravitational force there will be between two objects. Can you tell me what the value of big G is? Uh, no, uh, you know, you, uh, now I'm struggling, um, and especially remembering what the units are. I think it's something like uh, 6.7 times 10 to the minus uh, 11. Uh, it's 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, but I always have to look up what the units are. That one I'd actually have to look up. Why are you looking in your wallet? Because I keep it. <laughs> because I keep it, yes, I have guessed it right, and I can even give you the units now. <laughs> but Lawrence has a little card in his wallet that he's got it written on. <laughs> well, this is something very then? useful the that I guess I, it's actually from some uh, scientific journal. Phil Mag give you this. It's 6.67 times something. <laughs> okay. 10 to the something, but that's not very helpful. Uh, and it's got some fundamental constants. Well, I know most of these fundamental constants are three significant figures, but because I don't use big G very often, I, I usually have to look up what that is, but I have just about remembered it right to two significant figures. Why don't I need to know them? Uh, mainly because they're built into my calculator, so that whenever I actually do a calculation, I just press the big G button. Yes, always carry it around with me just in case I need it. Yeah, yeah very handy if you're doing, if you're stuck in a, in, a, in a delayed train or got a few spare hours doing something, it's always good to have it there and you can doodle around, think about things, have the constants in front of you. Well, a very important symbol for us is, of course, uh, the strength of the gravitational force on the surface of the Earth. That's the thing that keeps us firmly footed on the ground. Well, with G, particularly big G, it's all about gravity. And I'm partial to gravity because it is, to my mind, the most important force in the universe. The quantum mechanical way of thinking about forces, the, the microscopic way of thinking about forces, is that there are particles that kind of mediate the force. A particle goes from one place to another and tells you know, it tells one object to be attracted but or repulsed by another object. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the, the way we tend to picture uh, the, the forces of electromagnetism, where the particle that does that are photons, um, but also the, the forces that hold nuclei together and so on, the, the nuclear forces. Um, but for gravity, we don't really have that picture. I mean, we occasionally sort of try to sketch out a picture like that, and the, then the particle that mediates the force that tells things how to attract each other is called the graviton. Um, but we don't, we don't have a full theory that actually allows us to understand gravity in that way, the way that we do for the other forces. Well, if we recall those experiments that Galileo did um, uh, from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, so let me try and draw the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Well, big G is what we would call the gravitational constant, and it's a fundamental constant of nature. Um, comes into Newton's laws of gravity and uh, Einstein's laws of gravity. Um, little g is what we would talk about in terms of local gravity, so the gravitational acceleration that we feel, say, here on Earth, um, which is 9.8 meters per second per second. So anyway, if we imagine Gal Galileo sitting up here with a, a lead ball, a lead sphere. Little g is just the force of gravity here on the surface of the Earth. So it's, you know, if you drop something on the surface of the Earth, it's how far something will accelerate under gravity. 9.81 meters per second every second is how much faster it gets. Um, so, but at some level that's a very local and kind of parochial sort of thing. And let's imagine him dropping this so the sphere comes down to here under the force of gravity. And the gravitational force, of course, is given by the mass of the lead sphere times g. Then uh, what g tells us is how far the object will fall from the time uh, Galileo releases it uh, to fall under the force of gravity. And the distance s it travels, s, is then just equal to one half of g times t squared, where t is the time it's fallen. So after one second, this thing will have fallen by g upon two in one second. And then if we were put in there 9.8 over two, that tells us it's fallen about 4.9 meters. If you take a, a, a smaller planet like Mars, so let's imagine that we've got Mars that's smaller than the Earth by about that much. It's a little bit less dense as well, but not much less dense. They, they, uh, the average density of Earth and Mars are about the same. Uh, and then a bit smaller still, we have, we have the Moon, our Moon. And G is different on, on those three different uh, materials. So on, as I've said, on, on the Earth, G is equal to 9.8, and we give 9.8 meters per second squared, and we give it that symbol. But on Mars, uh, G is um, about one-third of G on Earth. And on the Moon, it's about one-fifth, if you recall when 
the astronauts went to the moon, they were even in their heavy spacesuits able to do very impressive jumps on the moon, and that's simply because that their muscles had less gravitational force to, to overcome. Off the ground, on the floor. There we go. So with Isaac Newton, we had a very simplistic form of gravity, and this is the way most of us think about gravity today, which is just two massive objects pulling each other together. Uh, we've moved over to this sort of Einsteinian view where the gravity is a distortion of space itself. Um, so for me, I've used in the past this idea of gravitational lensing. So let's imagine that this seat cushion here is our space-time. So it's, it's two dimensions of space, and we're going to warp it in, into a third dimension using my fist. So my fist represents a very massive object, say a black hole or a galaxy or even a cluster of galaxies. Um, you can see that it's made this sort of dimple in space in our analogy. Um, and what's going to happen is that any object coming near this massive object is going to feel the consequence of this space-time being warped. We have this, this mm -hmm. ball. This is going to be another object. And it's just happily making its way around ar ar through this neighborhood and it encounters this warping space-time. And what happens is that its path gets deflected. The exact same sort of thing can happen with light. And so we have, uh, say, a light source in the distance, dif distant universe, say another galaxy. Uh, it's emitting light. This light is following the same path that the ball did, and the light path also gets deflected. And so now the light changes course. OK, so let's imagine that we're actually sitting at a telescope. We're sitting over here at a telescope in er on Earth. Uh, and we're looking out in this general direction. We detect the light coming from this distant galaxy after it's been bent. Mm -hmm. But of course, we don't know it's been bent. In our view, light travels in a straight line. So we think it's come in this direction. And in fact, we don't see the original source in its original location. We see an image of it over here. And simply by measuring the angle that this light has been deflected between where it came from and where we actually see it, we can use general relativity to measure the mass of this deflecting object. And it doesn't matter if this is a massive galaxy that we can see or if it's a big lump of invisible dark matter. Gravitational lensing is the tool that lets us measure its mass. So we go back to my fist here. And we've said that the light coming in this direction has been deflected and made it to our telescope over here. But there's no reason that the light coming around this side of the galaxy can't be deflected as well. And in that case, we see not one, but two objects, uh, two images of the same object, but spaced out further apart on the sky. So once in a while, when you end up with things absolutely perfectly aligned, so you end up with an uh, object that's being lens, the lens, and us, all in an absolutely perfect straight line, um, then in that case, the light from the object that's being lens can actually go around the lens any way, any side of the lens. And so instead of just producing a multiple image or a distorted image, you end up producing a perfect ring of light in the sky. Uh, and that phenomenon is called uh, an Einstein ring, after Einstein, who actually predicted that th this phenomenon should be observed out there in the universe.